Okay, just need to, okay, just tell me when we're, are you? Oh, no, this is awkward. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm Rory, and I'm here at the LinuxConf to talk to you about programming for accessibility, but it's accessibility in open source. Um, and Microsoft is one of the leading uh, contributors to open source, and we made it our, our passion, our involvement, and we have been sponsoring this festival for a while. So if you can, everyone, uh, this is Microsoft uh, Presentation Translator, which aids both in real-time um, subtitles, and you can connect to the URL there, and it allows you to hear and listen back into any one of the 65 different languages. And an important concept to bear in mind is that all of our tools come with these accessibility features. Office, um, Azure has the immersive reader, um, even Project has accessibility functions. So um, my challenge to you is start looking at using presentation, presentation translator and subtitling your, your PowerPoints. So you can connect to the slides there. All of them are available aka.ms.linuxconf. There's slides, there's material, there's a lot of added information. And you can follow me on Twitter, which is important because I'm in constant competition with all of my colleagues. So opening slide, it's a little bit small here, but Microsoft loves open source. And we've been contributing to open source actually since 2004. And these slides actually show the journey here. And important to note that in uh, 2015, we had VS Code was released. In 2017 and 18, we bought GitHub which has 40 million developers, open source developers. In 2019, we got a development center in Nigeria and Kenya. We launched the first hypervisor data center in um, Southern Africa, in Africa. And, and also, we launched Azure DevOps free for open source projects. What does that mean? And I've been running labs here the whole day to day. And you get, if you have an open source project, which is just really a publicly facing uh, DevOps project, you can drive your entire DevOps process with open source. And I'm going to show you in the demo how you can actually take accessibility, the, the key of this uh, presentation, and tie into the DevOps process. So first, a story. So how did I get to this? So I've been speaking on programming for accessibility at everyone who will actually give me an opportunity, because to me, it's actually a lifelong journey. I started when I started to uh, acknowledge that certain things weren't accessible. So this is my midlife crisis, my BMW 335R. Um, and these are the pedals that are bolted on to the car to make it accessible for me. Now, word of advice, they did fail once. So if you are uh, behind a BMW with a 335i and you see something like happening there, just move to the, to the side. And I also make a plan. So where necessary, and you can see here I've got a nice little low table that the, uh, the audio team has given me, but I make a plan. So here's me speaking at the University of Bloemfontein on a chair. Here's me also trying to get coffee uh, at one of my employees. And yet, well, coffee or tequila, it's the same thing, but I'll, I'll make, a, make a plan. But it's been like this typically, historically, for every other accessibility function. So historically, the only real way that you could in engage if you were um, limited movement was called the sip and puff switch. So you would have a, an actual mouthpiece there that you can sip and puff and uh, engage with your computer. We also had the keyless keyboard by OrbiTouch, so you could rotate that according to the, num the letters and numbers that you wanted to do. So these are also, if you think of it, these are bolt-on. These are after the fact. Then we've got the vis visual impairments, the bolt-ons. So the refreshable Braille keyboard. So you plug it in there, and the Braille will actually lift up. And then you have the screen reader software. So if you switch that on, it will narrate everything that you're doing, similar to the software that I've got. This is the very, like, the later generation of screen reader software. Because if you go to that URL with the, the uh, present checks and translator, it will narrate everything, but it will narrate it with AI. And that's a key differential between the screen reader software, which is very, very verbose, to AI screen reader software. But how did I get to this talk? So you know that I had bolt on, and I bolted on everything. But then eventually, as part of my midlife crisis, I bought one of those BMI scales. <laughs> and I put it down there, and I, I jumped on it, and I, I started entering the criteria, and 
it, it says like you can see that there's a step-by-step -step wizard and I put in my uh, my height, four foot one, and two, I don't know how many centimeters, I think it's 120 centimeters. I put in my weight, 65 kilos, and then they had two little settings for a crawling baby and an adult man. And I thought, ooh, this is gonna not end well, actually. And I got on and you could see that there was a machine model churning out and processing, and it came back with the most heinous, like, you know, like you, like you, there's something wrong, please get off me. I, I think if the scale could scream, it actually screamed right there. But I felt a little bit disparate because I had always been able to bolt on stuff. And this was, the, this was a toy or a gimmick of the fourth industrial revolution, an AI-enabled device that was no longer being able to bolt on. I couldn't actually do that. So, and I made myself a challenge that I was going to, you know, not like, Affleck, well, he's out of the DC universe now. So I felt a little bit like sad Affleck, but I also made myself a challenge by this very glamorous gentleman who now also gets a bad rap. And I was going to speak on every opportunity on how to actually go and program and to incorporate uh, accessibility into open source and your workflows. So let's start. First, what are we gonna talk about today? First, I'm going to go through inclusive design, how to design for inclusivity without the bolt-on mindset, but to do it from the start. Then I'm going to go through website standards on what is the main gateway into your audience. It's web. We're going to go through a little uh, example, and I'm going to show you how to incorporate it into DevOps. Three, finally, we're going to look at how that scale was created. Someone must have sat in a room and actually created an AI model. We're going to go through the AI model and how to incorporate and remove bias from uh, AI. First step, inclusive design. So inclusive design is not knee-jerk reaction bolt-on. Inclusive design is the design of product services environments that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience them from the start. And what happens is that you create this, this environment of creativity and innovation that bubbles through and creates your products out of that design process. Because right at the bottom is inclusive product and service design, accessibility, compliance, productivity, and then you create innovation. It's hard for me to sell you this idea without actually showing you an example. So let's go through an example. To start off with this example, we need to understand that disability is not a mismatched, uh, sorry, a personal health condition. We're starting the design process. Disability is actually a misman, uh, mismanaged human uh, interaction. I'll give you an example. If you go to a doctor and you say to them, hey, I'm not feeling, feeling well, does he say to you, oh, sorry, you've got disability? <laughs> it doesn't exist until you can't do something. And I had this conversation with my, my boy. He's nine. He's also got a contraplasia dwarfism like me. And uh, uh, he said to me, um, I don't feel disabled. So I said to him, when do you feel disabled? And I put the, the actual scale down. And he went on and he goes, only on the scale. Because it's only on the scale that he feel that he was not being catered for. So inclusive design is the mindset of, wait a second, disability is only if you don't actually design for that. And now you can start to see where the innovation comes in. So let's go through the steps. One you need to recognize the exclusion. So you need to be able to understand bias and also what it's not catering for. Two, solve for one, extend to many. We're gonna look at how to create personas and how to uh, magnify those personas to cater for your accessibility. And three, learn from diversity, which is a, a magnificent new concept of, wait a second, something's changed. Let's change our entire journey to cater for that uh, disability. So here's our persona spectrum. So on the left here, you've got someone who's an amputee, born without an arm or uh, lost an arm, uh, one arm. And then you've got someone with an arm injury, motorcycle crash or car crash. And then over there, you've got a new parent. And now we all know that new parents are kind of disabled. Just if you if ever want to know, <laughs> both financially <laughs> and physically and yeah. Um, so if we were to design for the person with one arm, you go to your manager and say, I want to design for someone with one arm. You would never be able to justify that, the financial reason for that, because that individual, that population is only 26,000. These are the American dis uh, disability statistics. It's only 26,000. The arm injury, in the millions. The new parent, 
in the millions. So catering for that one persona spectrum, 26,000 plus 13 million plus 8 million, you actually cater for 21 million people. Then you can go into your design process and say, we're designing for this spectrum. And you create now, wait a second, what happens if someone is pregnant and they're not able to move something as heavy? You're creating and you're broadening that and you're creating innovation by catering for that spectrum. So this is a shopping cart example. I've got registration, navigation, and checkout. And in my registration, I've got start landing. I've got the actual uh, registration, the login, access to cart help, checkout, and then finally, um, review. Now, if I take my persona spectrum and I superimpose it there, it starts to become innovative because I can actually see, wait a second, my entire process changes. I now need to be create a responsive design. I now need to create a capture. I now need to have the ability to have an accessibility help desk and also possibly look at um, having bigger text or smaller text or changing the text size. And right at the end of that, I have an AI that says what happened in that process. How do I adjust the entire journey to cater for more accessibility? And that's the final bit, learn from diversity, learn from what people feed back. So let's look at an actual application, website accessibility. Let's start with what happened. So how did the web become and what is the drive towards web accessibility? And it's summed up by this statement from Bill Gates. For most of human history, we put our innovative capacity into improving the quantity of life. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift towards improving the quality of life. We've actually created an altruistic a uh, society that wants to do more. This is the, s the carrot. So this is the reward, but we also have the stick. We have the legislation. We have the uh, US 21st Century Integrated Digital uh, Experience Act and the EU Parliament Directive of Digital Accessibility that says by 2020, all mobile and web-facing apps, uh, public-facing apps will be accessible or up to $100,000 per day fine. Remember GDPR? Remember how hard that hit? Well, guess what's coming? Accessibility. Stick and carrot. Let's rather assume that everyone wants to actually do the carrot. So what is WCAG? What is the accessibility standard that they're trying to get us to, to follow? And how does it apply to, to web? One, it's very old. It was actually created in 1999 with 14 guidelines and 64 checkpoints, mainly on visual impairment. Then we had WCAG 2.0. They broadened it to four principles, 12 guidelines, and 61 success criteria, broadening the impairments, visual, mobility. And then finally, WCAG 2.1. They had new criteria for mobile, for low visibility, and learning disabilities. They realized that ADHD, uh, autism, and those disabilities were actually in the spectrum. So if you were to cater for a fully accessible site, you would have to cater for uh, ADHD and autism. But it's not that difficult, it really isn't, so don't, don't worry too much. Let's go through exactly what each of the criteria for those are. So you've got your compliance levels. So level A, so to cater for the uh, digital uh, acts, you have to cater for AA, WCAG 2.1. So AA deals with most basic web accessibility features, Sorry, A, and then AA signifies the biggest and most common barriers for disabled users. What I'm doing now with these subtitles, this is AA. That's what you have to do to cater for AA. If you have a video on your site, you have subtitles. And then finally, AAA, which means that you are catering for the nuances and the special needs of people with disabilities. So if you have a video and it shows a cat, you would have narration of the actual person speaking, but you'd also have the backdrop speaker to say, and there is a cat. Because you're catering for someone to give them context of the broader uh, video's contextual um, timing. There's four main accessibility principles in WCAG. There's perceivable, can you see it? Operable, can you use it? Understandable, can you understand it? And finally, robust. It won't break future technologies. Let's go through an example for each. One, perceivable. So perceivable is alt text, is captions. And you can see there that this is an apex predator, which we've actually captioned as cute cat. 
My daughter wants a cat. So I'm, I'm trying to tell her. She goes, no, it'll scratch me a little. I said, mm-mm, mm-mm. You try to kill the dog, it's gonna, you're gonna ki- the cat's going to kill you. <laughs> Perceivable is also about color blindness. One out of 20 men are color blind. One out of 200 women. So if you are actually creating a website, do not use color to indicate alerts or errors. This is an example here that shows you with the red text that is actually not accessible to one out of 20 uh, people. Captions, video captioning. So this is my hero, Ron Swanson. He likes meat, carpentry, and uh, whiskey. But you will notice also that he is not actually laughing. So if you just take your captions and you chuck them onto YouTube or or a process and you just leave them and say, that's enough, that's not going to work. So we have something called a um, video analyzer, Microsoft Video Analyzer. It's free to use, a video indexer, sorry. Um, That'll allow you, and you'll see there a movie that I'm going to play later. I did that through Video Indexer. And it will use the same technology here. It will build up a lexicon and tap into Azure AI to bring you back those captions. So there's no excuse to not caption your your, uh, videos. Hypertext, navigation, can you actually use it? So this is an example of a really bad hyperlink that someone actually has pasted into. You can't follow that. <laughs> but Navigal, how many times have you actually put a hyperlink there that wouldn't be able to be read by a screen reader? It will just read the click here without having an alt text or where you're going to go. How to transverse a website. So this is my favorite keyboard. It's called the Stack Overflow Copy and Paste Keyboard, Control-C and Control-V. How many times have you looked at your website that you've programmed and tried to actually switch your mouse off and navigate just with your keyboard? Chances are you can't, because what happened at some point, someone went and changed the tab index of one of your controls with the mindset of being able to do that uh, with, you know, with the catering for accessibilities, but they never revisited it. And we'll look at exactly why and how you should later on. Operable. It's a nice little piece of HTML code. And it's nicely semantically coded. You've got your P's, you've got your H's, and you've got your, an ordered list. But I can do the exact same with uh, unsemantic code. This is the exact same there. I've got a list, I've got a P tag, theoretically. But what happens when a screen reader reads this? What would it read? It won't know it's a list. It won't know this is a P tag. It will be completely useless to someone who is uh, visually impaired. Understandable. So one of my pet projects is uh, to paste uh, volume um, indicators. So this is a volume indexer that you actually have to pump up to get to the right volume. These are actual examples. Here's one where you have to uh, scream into the actual um, PC to get the right level. And finally, I couldn't even get it at the right level, one where you have to change the gear ratios perfectly to get to the right volume. These are possibly funny to give to, but they're a nightmare for people to actually use, though. Not everyone can even have proper mouse control. Robust, scalable. People who have accessibility needs usually use their, their mobile device as their principal device, and they use it in landscape mode. Yes, landscape mode. Because it's easier to view like that. So how often have you actually created a responsive site? So now that we've looked at how and what you should do and cater for, let's also look at the next level, the AAA, on how you could uh, design for accessibilities. In, uh, and steps in is WAARIA, or ARIA for short. And this is the Web Accessibility Initiative to Access Rich Internet Applications. This is having a next level of consciousness of catering for people with uh, accessibility requirements. And you have four main criteria, row attributions, live regions, landmark roles, and states and properties. Let's go through each one. So one first, ARIA is markup. It, um, it predates HTML5. It's just plain HTML markup. So you've got a role there, main, uh, main role because main, a state, invalid equals to true. So you, you're showing it, and you're speaking through to the accessibility um, tooling. Property, first name, type equals a text, ARIA required equals to true. Two, ARIA is HTML5. Have you ever wondered how HTML5 suddenly leapt in leaps and bounds when it came to semantic uh, format? 
Doesn't it look very similar to ARIA? So ARIA there, and remember, it predates it. Article, article, header, header, navigation, nav, complementary aside. Because people with accessibilities needed semantically uh, well-formed pages before HTML5 had been uh, created. So let's go through a rule. So this was very hard for me to find. Have you ever tried to Google uh, Lego Fight Club? This is the only thing that really comes up that is clean. So this is Lego Fight Club, and this is the first rule of ARIA, of catering for people with accessibilities, is no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. Remember the tab index, if you navigate to your site, if someone had good intentions at one point and then they stopped? So if you're going to bring in ARIA, then make sure that you carry on with it, else do not change it. Because ARIA is HTML5. If your page is HTML5 semantically clean and marked up, then it will work with ARIA. Do not use ARIA if existing HTML tags already provide the same functionality, the second rule of ARIA. So we've looked at how to cater for website accessibility with uh, the four rules, the principles. We've also looked at how to cater it for, if you want to cater for it, go t a step further. OK, so here's uh, principle one, our roles are promised. ARIA pressed equals false. But if you notice here, a role is a promise, and I'm introducing it to um, and trying my best to have good intentions, I can also make a stumbling block here. So right at the bottom there, it says there, assistive tech users perceive the element as an item and menu, not a link. I'm actually creating an error with the screen reader software. ARIA label, assistive tech users can only perceive the content of this ARIA label, not the link text. Right now, they'll read the um, ARIA label and not the actual link text. So it's important to understand that no ARIA is better than, uh, sorry, uh, bad ARIA, and also ARIA is a promise. Keep calm, it's demo time. Recently released, two things, two critical um, tooling. One is that we released the entire tooling for our, our uh, accessibility insights. The same tools that we test office.com, uh, the Windows sites, Azure, we actually have open source, Accessibility Insights, and you can access it at accessibilityinsights.io. Two is that we released our DevOps pipelines to test for this. And I'm going to show you an interesting demo that's going to actually use that, and we're going to run some tests. So you can access it on github.com forward slash Microsoft forward slash x dash pipelines dash samples. Okay, hopefully everyone can see me here. I am now going to do the impossible by work with the screen that is on my left and my right, or up and down, something like that. Okay, so I've got my, um, my GitHub page here, and I've forked it into Visual Studio Code. Let's go left, let's go right. It's coming. There we go. So bear with me now. So this is a fork of the project that I showed you, the X pipelines. And I've got in the X pipelines, it's got some C sharp code, it's got some uh, TypeScript code, and you can run the, the test case in it, but we've got a nice little test page here, which I'm gonna drag over here. And in the test page, it says here, I've got some area issues. Now I'm gonna test this both manually, and then I'm gonna test it with the DevOps plugin. So over here, you've got the input box, lacks an accessible label, which violates WCAG 2.A rule label. It has no real accessible label. So if I look in the underlying HTML code, it has no a label. The text color, the next one, is too low, which violates WCAG rule color contrast. That's very difficult for people who have low visibility to see. And then lastly, the button uses a tab index greater than zero, which violates best practice rule tab index. So I can't tab to it. No, but there's right at the top there, there's nothing wrong with this paragraph, so it has something good. Now I'm going to switch on the, uh, the tooling that will test this, and you can do that by just installing the Accessibility Insights for Web from the Chrome or the Edge Insider um, Marketplace, and I'll switch that on. And I'm going to run FastPass, which is going to give me an instant view of what my accessibility issues. There's also more details. You can go to access, uh, Assessment and also Ad Hoc Tools. I'm going to run FastPass. And it's going to tell me, wait a second, there's some errors here. And it's also going to highlight the errors and the issues there. And I can click through that. 
and I can file the issue straight to GitHub if I want to. And this is manual testing. So I can file that through there. What about tab index? You can see that this is a tab indexed. So I can go here, and I can go to ad hoc tools, and I can switch on here tab stops. If I switch on tab stops here, I can now tab through and see, wait a second, this has an incorrect tab index. The tab index is one, it starts off there. So you can actually do these tests online, and you can also do these tests in Azure DevOps. So this is the X pipeline samples that will run and execute the code. So in my Visual Studio project that I've got here, Visual Studio Code, I've got the, the exact same tests here, test uh, load test page, test ac accessibility of single element, test with gag compliance, and then um, do some filtering. Now if I execute this uh, on tests here, I can actually run those tests there, both locally, and I can also run this, once these are running, in my DevOps pipeline. And you can see there that everything ran fine, and it's actually uh, executing. So these are the same rules that I ran using the accessibility insight. So you can run it in DevOps, and you can actually run it also in your uh, browser. Left, 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 resume slideshow, and we're back. Demo time, easy to do, easy to start. Let's go through AR for accessibility. So in many years, I started speaking on how I was not related to Tyrion Lannister. I started actually using AR to prove this. This is me not being Tyrion Lannister. I also tried to use AI, and I created an Alexa bot because I wanted to pass the button Rick and Morty bot. And I kept on screaming at this. This is an important concept to understand because people with accessibility requirements need to understand that AI understands their uh, requirements. And someone who's screaming might be in trouble. Someone who's screaming might also be of uh, uh, short of hearing. Because what you want, you want the world to change for you. You want the world to be uh, accessible without having um, to, to cater, to bolt on. So these steps there can change for the individual person based on their accessibility needs. They don't have to actually be bolt on. Of course, you can actually do it wrong, and we saw how you can do it with ARIA, so these are not accessibility steps. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't actually try. And the key to AI accessibility is to understand that AI needs to understand that sentiment and also engagement is not zero one. To understand AI accessibility is to understand human emotion. Let's go through that. So sentiment is not zero one. Because sentiment is actually an entire spectrum. Over here on the side there you have uh, boredom, which leads to disgust, which leads to loathing. That's how complicated it is. Have you ever wondered why a child who's bored can't sit still? Or an adult who can't sit still? Because your body's natural evolutionary trait is to say, wait a second, you might have been poisoned, go move out and get healthy. So if you are bored, please go down. Uh, there's a paramedic waiting down there that will give you some Netflix and help you get out of the boredom. But this is important to understand because human emotion is incredibly complex. How do we bring now accessibility into AI? So the key is that we're training it. We are the litmus test to understand emotionality in accessibility. The Clever Sparks in MIT realized that this was very difficult. So what they did is they started scanning your Twitter tweets for emojis. So they scanned 55 billion emojis to see, wait a second, can we create an entire uh, emotional spectrum and build it into AI? And they created, after they sanitized that they created these categories of here. And the one that we want to see or are interested is the sarcasm emoji, or the I'm not impressed face. So when we put it into Deepmoji, you can access it on deepmoji.mrt.edu. Coming from Johannesburg, questionable electricity. The electricity is off again, oh joy. <laughs> it knew the emotional uh, flow there. I could see that I was actually being sarcastic. So now we know how to actually cater for this. We know that uh, an emotionality is a spectrum, not, e not a zero one. So build it into Cortana, build it into Siri. Build it into Bixie. Have you ever wondered why now, suddenly, when you scream at your digital assistant, it reacts differently? Each one of the companies actually has an emotional team. Remember at the beginning? Learn from diversity, create a team, an awareness of that. 
Because when you scream at that little Alexa robot, you don't want it to just say, I don't know what you're saying. You want it to hush, and it will. It will start to whisper back at you. And we're also seeing that now with AI in the browser, you can start to cater for accessibility requirements, individual accessibility requirements per user, innovation. So when I log into a web page and it says, do you have any accessibility requirements? It's, and I say, yes, my expectation is that the entire web process, the journey, will mold to my unique criteria. So in summary, how do we learn from diversity? How do we teach AI? One, define bias as a spectrum. Two, enlist customers to correct bias. Remember, you right now are training Deepmoji. Cultivate diversity with privacy and consent, obviously. Balance intelligence with discovery. And finally, build inclusive AI teams. There is no one who will be a bigger advocate to accessibility than someone who has a friend or family member who has an accessibility requirements. Statistically, there are one billion people who have accessibility requirements. When you take their friends and family, that is three billion people. That's then half the population of the world. Those people will be the bigger, biggest advocates to build those accessibility teams. If you hire them into your company, if you have diversity hire for accessibility requirements, that innovation will start, and we've seen that at Microsoft. You create products like this, the seeingar.com. On your iPhone hand, it will narrate your entire world, but it will also narrate the emotions, because in being able to sense the emotionality of a room is an important part, because you, you want to feel involved. And finally, we can do this. Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and, yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like, oh, do, 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 do. she's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. And we created that adaptive controller because we had an, a diverse, accessible team who understood the unique requirements. So in summary, in conclusion, one, inclusive design, the process to go about and to create that, that environment of um, innovation. Two, website standards, it's coming. Let's rather do carrot before the stick. And three, AI. Let's actually show how to be empathetic to people's accessibility requirements. So if you want, you can access all of these slides along with some labs and the DevOps uh, code on aka.ms forward slash linuxconf, and you can follow me on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. Questions. OK, so you can, um, normally we ask the questions here, but we'll just leave that. So question, yes. Um, I'm very intrigued by the legislation that you mentioned with the European Accessibility Act. Yes, and the US Federal D uh, Digital Act. So are those being enforced right now? 
So right now, those are being driven to mainly governmental sites. Uh, but as Microsoft, our standard is that we adhere to those, uh, to WCAG 2.0. What's going to happen is Canada's already kind of said by 2020, they're going to fine people $100,000 per day if you do not have an accessible site. So first is, let's actually help you through the journey. Next is now, like GDPR, now it's legislation. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a slow progress to getting people on board, and then they give a set amount of time. After that time, okay, no more uh, spoon feeding. Basically. It's like your tax. It's easier to do it before. Don't yeah. wait until the last second. <laughs> cool. And, and is there perhaps something like that currently happening in South Africa? or What you'll find is that a lot of companies that have European and American influence are already doing it. Okay. So if you take the tooling that I gave you right now and you go into uh, office.com, you'll find that we are accessible already because that is already happening because we want to first of all, mm. drive that culture into our organization yeah. before, it, before it comes digital, uh, sorry, difficult to actually backtrack and say, now we need to be accessible. Ah, uh, I see. So instead of just waiting for it to become law, we rather we, yes. do it sooner than later. Yes, the right, <laughs> the right way. Yeah, I see. Wow, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, like I've mentioned, I've always, I've recently become so interested in, in, in serving applications to very like low bandwidth areas like in areas like india townships or things like that in south africa but this is something i've never really looked at that deeply i just knew it was very important so it covers a bit when the responsive design remember that i said that you have to have it in yeah. in landscape to maybe uh, to cater for that so that's one aspect of it so one of the criteria is to be able to cater for low bandwidth yeah. and to cater for text only compared to uh, video. Yeah, yeah. So it does, though. So have a look at WCAG uh, 2.1, uh, and you'll probably find that it will open your eyes to an entire world of spectrums that you weren't aware of. And secondly, those spectrums are freely available. There are hundreds, and it's not only Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, uh, IBM, they all have these, pe uh, these pers uh, personas, because yeah. this is actually older than computing. This is user-centered design that was mm -hmm. created in the 1920s when they started designing cockpits for fighter engines and realized that they weren't designing for uh, everyone, just the average, and they c created the ability to move your, your chair. User-centered design. Okay. That's interesting. Oh, really nice, man. Enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. A lot. <laughs> I have a question. But oh. You can stop, because the next group needs to set up as well. Okay. Um, have you ever quantified? I mean, business is about bottom line. Have you ever quantified the effect that having accessibility to sites and et cetera has on the bottom line of the business? We have stats for that. Yeah. We actually can show that a company that uh, tr tries to be diverse in their hiring mm -hmm. and also hires for accessibility is up to, I think it was up to 20%, uh, but this is a long-term cultural significant change though. 20% um, more revenue in certain circumstances by actually adopting that. Because it also means that you can cater for other things like the elderly, pregnancy, colorblind, people who are, um, you know, who are running through a high stress. It's not only people without an arm who are Im immobile, it's the entire perspective. It's everyone. Yeah. Interesting, thanks. Thank you.